let's see. Okay. We have um, excited, and I'm very excited and um, just uh, excited to be on this call, excited to be a part of this, um, this program. We are observing Women's History Month, but we also are acknowledging the uh, one, one um, senator who made history in the state of Maryland, that is Senator Berta Welcome, who was the first, um, she was the first female elected in the Maryland State Senate, but she was elected in the same year as another um, female, a woman, a sister, all that. And we just don't want anybody to forget that. Um, and she Absolutely. literally paved the way for what we're doing today. She paved the way for sisters like, I mean, y'all know we got a Supreme Court justice coming down the pike. You know, this is some, this is some exciting stuff. This week is big. This month is big. Um, I want to give a shout out to my wife. Her birthday is tomorrow. Um, Cynthia Fike's birthday is today. These are all good people doing good work. Um, but the most important thing here today is that we're um, celebrating um, the Maryland State Conference NAACP. Those who don't know me, I'm Willie Flowers, the president of um, the state conference. If you're not a member of NAACP, we want you to get a membership. Go to NAACP.org and say you're one of us. Um, but <laughs> what we are trying to kick off today, and I'm going to let our um, chair of women in NAACP take this over. It's a ladies' night event. I'm just here to kind of kick it off and kill some time so that we can hit 7 o'clock. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's very we important to, to acknowledge this stuff when we're making history. I mean... Neither one of these women thought they were going to be making history this this year before they got that call. And um, <laughs> I'm not going to let them forget about it, you know. So I think that Maryland is the only state where you can have not only one, two, three, and I think four African-American women uh, running for lieutenant governor. And I want to give you all a round of applause uh, all day long. This is a big deal. I wish I had some sound effects. But um, I... Um, <laughs> I say that with excitement. I say it with um, love. I say it with the concern that you have made a decision as public officials. And, and all of these, these um, sisters have already done their work um, to be in the job that they're in. There's no question that they're, they're qualified and prepared to do what they're doing. But our job is the icing on the cake. We want to make sure that the world knows that in Maryland in 2022 that we have <laughs> three, and I think someone else is in the race, three sisters um, on the ballot in July to be the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Maryland. And that's a big deal for me. I'm excited just thinking about it and I'm glad. And I hope that all, you know, all the young people see this because this is something I never saw in my lifetime. I think that, I don't think this has happened. Um, I, I will, I will just say that it has never happened in any state, in any place in the world. And Maryland made this history and I'm, I'm not going to let anybody forget about it. So, um, that's all I have to say. Again, I'm Willie Flowers, joined the NAACP, NAACP.org. We have, um, the Honorable Monique L. Anderson Walker on, um, we have the Honorable Candace Hollingsworth, um, Candace Hollingsworth, you had a middle name, didn't you? Hollingsworth, and we have the Honorable Shannon Steed. And um, I'm going to step off the, I'm going to let y'all do y'all thing. This is ladies night. Do your thing. I love all y'all. And um, <laughs> hey, just, you know, I hate to, I, I got to bring it up because he was the first to keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. How about that? And I'm going to introduce y'all to <laughs> introduce to some and present to others the um, chair of women in the NAACP for the state of Maryland, Brooke McCauley, the one and only. Here she is. Go ahead. You got it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Willie. We appreciate your leadership. Um, you have been a strong leader for the NAACP here in the state of Maryland, um, working across the state in every jurisdiction to get the branches up and going, supporting uh, the women and the youth councils around the state as well making sure those at, in the legislature, uh, right now legislative session, hear our voices, those on Capitol Hill, they're hearing our voices and, and it's because of your leadership. And so we appreciate you. 
And I appreciate all of the women for joining us tonight for our pilot show for Maryland, the WIN Committee, the Women in the NAACP State Committee. This is our pilot show on live stream. So we thank you all for joining us today, taking time out of your busy, grueling schedule, because I know it's a grueling schedule when you are running for office, especially for a statewide position, but you thought it not robbery to be here with us tonight. And as Willie touched on, it is a momentous time. Um, I have not had a chance yet to look at any of the confirmation hearing, but I will be watching some of the playback and tuning in this week when I get a chance for our first African-American woman nominated to the Supreme Court. So excited about that. We also stand uh, in a historical moment with the first vice president being uh, the first vice president of the country, being an African-American woman. Um, and that comes on the heel of Mrs. Michelle Obama being the first lady, the first African-American um, first lady here in the country. But we know that there's still a lot of work to do. So I celebrate each of you for the courage to just step up and commit to running your, your races. And we're gonna find out a lot more about you this evening and our all of our viewers are gonna find out a lot more about you this evening by the time we get finished with the show. But I'm gonna take a breath and then just again, thank you for joining. <laughs> and just tell you a little bit more for those who are tuning in at 7 p.m. We are, we are live and we are excited to get going. So Ms. Verda, welcome, as Willie touched on just a few moments ago, um, historic figure, we stand on her shoulders and that is who this symposium is named after, stand on her shoulders and the shoulders of so many more, who's, some of whose names we may never know, who knocked on doors and got people registered to vote and had the courage to organize in the communities um, facing violence and possibly even death. But we here stand today because of them and because of their legacy. Uh, the WIN Committee is the Women in NACP Committee. There are WIN committees at branches across the state and around the country. We are dedicated to uplifting and empowering women and girls, standing for women and their children, helping to ensure that the issues that are important to women and children are lifted up uh, on the NAACP agenda for civil and human rights. So with that, we're going to get started with and begin tonight with introductions of everyone who is here on the show. So I'm going to start out with the Honorable Monique Anderson Walker. She was the first African-American woman elected to the Prince George's County 8th Council District. Welcome. In 2016, she founded Flora DeLise, the commercial real estate brokerage firm, uh, in the Nash, which is located in the National Harbor. When she was elected, she focused on numerous economic development initiatives, careers in technology and innovation. She founded her own STEAM camp for families to help encourage youth and young people to get involved in careers in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And she, was, she served as the vice chair of transportation infrastructure and the planning board for the Council of Governments, championing modernizing of the transit grid to enable business growth and development in Prince George's County. So welcome to you again. Next, we have Ms. Candace Gansler so Hollingsworth. I'm sorry. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. We have Ms. Candace Gans Gansler Hollingsworth. Dr. Hollingsworth. <laughs> okay. Ms. Candace Hollingsworth, elected to mayor of Hyattsville. She was the youngest and first African-American um, ever elected there in Hyattsville. While serving as mayor, she prioritized equity and shared prosperity for all of her residents, focusing on tax incentives, which created affordable housing in targeted areas, and $1 million, wow, $1 million relief fund for residents and small businesses who were decimated by COVID. She served as the board member of the Prince George's County African American Museum and Cultural Arts Center. And she received her BA in African American History from Emory and is a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And last but certainly not least, we have Ms. Shannon Sneed, who began her career as an assignment editor and a producer in Baltimore at local news stations, where she began her advocacy by telling the stories of residents. She went on to work with Big Brother and Big Sister, 
uh, help recruiting mentors for young people, which is so important, working again for the Baltimore mayor's office with their employment and development department, helping people find family sustaining jobs, which is so important. And then in 2016, after working in the community, she ran and was elected for city council in Baltimore City in District 13, where she championed legislation that supported city employees. So she stood for living wages, paid sick leave, lactation accommodations, and lifted up working families and neighborhoods. She's a graduate of Emerge Maryland. She has her bachelor's in English uh, from the University of Maryland Eastern Shore and is also a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. So once again, welcome ladies. We're gonna kick off and dive right into the questions. And we want the audience to just get to know you a little bit better. So how about we start out with you telling us a little bit about yourselves. We want the viewers to get to know you and how would your friends describe you? What are your hobbies? Do you have a favorite quote or scripture that inspires you and, and why that particular quote or scripture? Each of you will have three minutes to share. And why don't we kick off with you, Shannon, since you were the last person I introduced. Oh, perfect. Um, so I am married. I'll be married 15 years in April. I can't believe it. Um, I'm so excited about that. I am a mom to a five-year-old beautiful baby girl, Ray. Um, I'm a graduate, like you said, of University of Maryland Eastern Shore, Go Hawks, a uh, member of Alpha Kappa Alpha. I crossed that Eastern Shore, master's degree from Morgan State University, where are my bears? Um, like you said, started my career at Fox 45 in Baltimore, and, um, moved on to WJZ. You said if you make it to the top of the hill where Oprah was, you definitely made it to the top. Um, I would say that friends would say that I'm passionate, refreshing, uh, loving, hardworking. Uh, a quote that I'm definitely going to use that I've heard all my life. I went to a little Christian school, uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, but to give you hope in the future. And so um, some of my books uh, that I love, um, reading books and traveling to new places. During COVID, I even got to see new places here in uh, Maryland. So it's been fun. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you so much. I'm going to go next to Candice. Let's hear from you. Good evening, everyone. I just want to thank you for the opportunity and the chance to be in community with my sisters. I think that is a wonderful thing. And I love that you all are making sure that we remember the history that we're making every day, because it's important that we do that. Um, I'm Candice. Bacchus Hollingsworth is my middle name. I'm a Bacchus from Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I'm a Memphis girl, Southern girl at heart. So a lot of things that I care about my demeanor. A lot of that is reflected every day because of that. I have two beautiful children, Ellis and Zora. Ellis is 16. My daughter, Zora, is 13. Uh, they are probably the, the best. I shouldn't call them accomplishments, but they are the best thing I've ever done in life. Um, I got my undergraduate degree at Emory University in African-American studies and my master's from Georgetown University in education, family, and social policy. Um, by day, I work at an organization called the Core Network, which is a national member association of service and conservation corps, uh, where, I, where I support 16 nonprofit organizations across the country in building their programs to serve young people, particularly opportunity youth, those who are not in school and not working to get them on a path to jobs and to post-secondary education opportunities. Um, my hobbies, I love reading, I love writing. Um, I communicate best in writing. And it's my opportunity to really get my thoughts out on paper. I am, as an, an, as an 81 baby, I'm a fan of 90s R&B. And I love mm -hmm. Southern hip hop, um, especially mm -hmm. A-Ball and MJG. Those are my favorite. And my favorite quotation is by Milan Kundera in my favorite book, which is The Unbearable Lightness of Being. And it is, what can life be worth if the rehearse first rehearsal for life is life itself? And for me, that just means that every day we are going on cold. We don't know exactly what to expect, but we have to make sure that we make the most out of every day and every single opportunity. So thank you for having me this evening. Thank you. And yeah, I think I, hey. I got lost for a little bit, but I'm back. <laughs> That's all right, you made it back and, and right on time. And it is your turn, the Honorable Monique Anderson Walker. Please share a little bit about yourself and uh, our viewers. Thank you, thank you so much, Brooke, for having us. And I wanted to thank Candace Hollingsworth and Shannon Sneed. Um, just they're phenomenal women. And I'm just really honored to be 
uh, on a platform with them because uh, we have done tremendous things and we will continue to do tremendous things. It's an honor. I also do want to say Candace and I have uh, a good bit in common in that uh, we're both graduates of Emory University. <laughs> uh, and I am a graduate of HBCU as well, Howard University for one of my master's and uh, then Johns Hopkins for another one of my master's degrees. Um, but listen, I am a 51-year-old mother of three, small business owner. Uh, in a nutshell, that kind of guides everything. Uh, as a mother of a 23, 22, and 16-year-old, my focus is them and our future. And so education and health have been two top priorities for me uh, because I recognize that's where wealth is won and lost in those areas of education and health. Um, I, I do think that it's important to maybe know a little bit about one of my favorite verses, um, which is Roman 8, 28. Uh, the, the challenge with life is that you don't, you have your plans, but your plans are not the plan. And so I like to think that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And with mm -hmm. that, I can go through anything. And the truth is I've gone through some stuff. And I think that makes me um, battle tested without a doubt, um, but sensitive to what challenges people are going through. And uh, I think my friends would say the same. I'm sensitive, I'm very passionate um, and relentless. And I think those are good things <laughs> for the most part. Um, uh, it's an honor again to be here. I think I've answered all the questions that you had for me. Um, but, you did. Uh, you know what? Since you answered it. Yes, you answered the last. The last part of your answer goes right into my next question. So I'm going to kick this next part off with you. And so I'm going to ask you, what made you get into public service, and what issues are you most passionate about? Well, um, you know, I kind of touched on on the the passion issues, um, health care. Uh, because I think that's a, a great equalizer, access to health care. Uh, another great equalizer, of course, is education. When I say education, it's the opportunities that we get, exposure opportunities. And that's one of the things I really want to focus on and focus on as a council member. Um, I fought as a council member to, uh, to make sure that economic gain and, and, and wealth was possible for us. Uh, and the ways I did that was to make sure we didn't increase um, taxes on our on our properties, which uh, there was a, a push to do so during COVID, probably the time we were at our most vulnerable. Uh, but there was a recognition that, hey, people are suffering already. Don't don't let them suffer more and, and don't put them in positions where they'll lose their wealth. I view everything in terms of wealth building. Um, home ownership, that's part of wealth building. Uh, part of our platform is uh, related to uh, state-backed mortgages because there's a recognition that we want to level the playing field and ownership is a big part of that leveling uh, with businesses, specifically black-owned businesses and minority businesses. And the truth is anyone on the margin, and that's not just black, but uh, but they're, they're rural issues and they're urban issues and they're the same issues. So we want to make sure that we level the playing field so that all have opportunities. Um, but your question was what really pushed me Man, as a mother, concerned about what will my children be doing in the future? You know, is education really providing them, the education that we have, really providing them with what they need for the future? And the truth is, the jobs of today will not be the jobs of the future. We need to build innovators. We need to invest in our children as young as preschool to get them into um, the passion of STEM, STEAM learning, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. Uh, and I have done implemented some programs locally as a council member and I'm looking to scale that because I recognize that that is the that's the way to build innovators and that's the way to uh, build an economy. Um, lastly, I'll just mention that uh, healthcare is uh, another opportunity for us to build an economy. We have um, tremendous uh, teaching hospitals. We've got uh, biotech corridors here, NIH. We've got other health focused and wellness opportunities here. And we need to take advantage of educating our kids so that they're at a point in high school as they graduate to be certified as technicians, certified in areas to go straight into the workforce. Similarly with STEAM fields, we, we wanna see that, but also with uh, infrastructure. Infrastructure is a huge problem. I'll stop there because I could tell I might've gone over three minutes, <laughs> but I'm um, happy to answer any other questions that you have later. Thank you. Obviously obviously passionate you'll get a chance to talk a little bit more with Candace let's go back to you 
let's can you share a little bit about why you decided to get in <clears throat> excuse me public service and what issues you're most passionate about sure so i never planned to be in definitely didn't plan to be in elected office it wasn't something that if you gave me a list of things that i wanted to put on a bucket list oh being mayor yeah i want to do that that wasn't something running for lieutenant governor nope didn't have that on my 10 year or 20 year plan um my husband and i moved to highsville in december 2009 and this was at a time when we had every intention of moving back to Atlanta, Georgia, to be honest, to be closer to family, be closer to our um, our network that we had there to raise our kids. And at that time, if you can recall, it was probably the worst time to be looking for a job um, when the recession hit. It was also it was also thanks to President Obama, the best time to buy a house <laughs> if you were a first time homeowner. So we found a house in Hyattsville. And I didn't know anything about it. But one thing I did know is that this is going to be my home. And in part of making a place my home, I needed to understand um, how it worked. What was who was governing? What were the who were the people in charge? What did they believe? And in the process of getting to know that, I also thought about where I was as a, what was it, I guess, 27, 28 year old um, with two kids at this, at that point in my life, what was important to me. And I was thinking about as a 28 year old, it doesn't matter how old you are. You never want to disappoint your parents. You miss your mom. You miss your dad. You want to be near them. And I wanted very much so to be closer to my family. Yet I was not because in Memphis, there were not the opportunities that we needed, that I needed in order to build the life that I envisioned for my family. And I said selfish, selfishly to myself, I wanted Hyattsville to be a community that my kids could always feel that they could return home to, that they felt there was a place for them to find housing they could, they could afford, that they could you know, support their family at whatever phase of life they were, that they found things that were enjoyable. And they felt like it was a community that nurtured them and who they became to be. And so my path to doing that became, elect, became elected office. But I'm not a stranger to public service. I'd served in, you know, as president of Black Student Alliance at Emory and council member in Hyattsville, um, was on the PTA. That was the very first role that I served when I moved to Hyattsville. Um, all of those things are my way of contributing the skills and expertise that I have to match them to the opportunities and the needs of the moment. Um, and so the things that I'm passionate about, I'm always passionate about education and helping young people thrive. I look at my two uh, my two kids, and I see the opportunities that they are blessed with because we are in a position to be able to provide those things for them. But we know that's not the case for every young person in this state. And so to be able to do that across the state um, really motivates me. And then secondly, and not less importantly, is building community. We build community by making sure that we have places, whether it's community among people, if it's community among place, Building community means that we're creating the ties and the bonds between one person to another so that we all recognize our duty and our obligation in caring for and seeing that we are all our best selves and able to be our best selves. And so the way that we've done that in Hyattsville, um, actually, I laugh because my son said he wants to be close to this house. <laughs> so I think I might have done my job a little too well. But um, the way that we do that the way that we care for young people, the way that we care for those most in need is an indicator of where our values lie. And I'm just really um, excited about being able to do that work on a larger platform and a larger scale for all of Maryland to be able Thank to experience you. what we built in Hyattsville. Excellent. Thank you. Shannon, what are you most passionate about and why did you decide to get in public service? What were those stories that you heard as a reporter? That Right. I was about to say I was on the other side interviewing and getting folks ready to uh, go in front of the camera so we could tell our stories. I was very um, trying to make sure that I told the stories of the black community, but I got started because I bought a house. I say my husband and I started adulting. Um, and so we bought this house in East Baltimore um, and um, it was literally one tree on our block. And they say, you know, if if there's something to be done, if you're trying to get something to do, give a busy person, a busy woman to do and she will get it done. Um, and I'm like, councilman, I reached out to the councilman in uh, the district and I said, listen, you have a lot of new neighbors here. We are trying to uh, make a difference here. Um, let's plant some trees. Let's beautify. Like, let's do our part. And he was like, no, not interested. 
And I'm like, no, 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 no. You you have people here who want to make a difference in Baltimore City. Um, they want to be active. They, they want to make sure that uh, we just have a safe, um, green, beautiful place to live. And the councilman wasn't interested. Um, we then went to a community meeting um, and um, he actually said the same thing out loud. We were at like a watershed meeting. And so um, neighbors then, and I say my neighbors, bless their hearts, uh, three women there, not alive today, um, said to me, we gonna help you. You are the youngest thing around here and I'm gonna help you become the next councilman. I'm like, WJZ has never been late on a check. I'm good. We're just going to like help him um, and we're going to do our part. Um, and then it didn't happen. Um, our, one of my neighbors, who's now a delegate in Annapolis, Delegate Robin Lewis, sat me down and said, no, you, you need to really think about this. I came home complaining and my husband said, so are you going to complain about it or are you going to change it? And I decided to run for office. Um, and from that day, the environment, uh, education, my daughter um, is five years old and she's in a public school in Baltimore City. Schools are very important to me, um, always have been. I've volunteered in schools in Baltimore City as a councilwoman. Uh, I make sure that I participate, um, even just as a citizen, a, a neighbor in my neighborhood that I do that. Um, and healthcare is very important to me. My mother had a stroke recently. Um, and sometimes you don't know what you don't know, but let something happen. Um, my mother's whole life changed. She literally had a stroke at my grandmother's funeral from being her caretaker. And so she went from being the caretaker to being sick, to not able to drive her car anymore, hardly able to walk. And mm -hmm. so when something like that hits your home, it affects all of us. My mother has three girls. She's a single mother. My, my oldest sister died at a young age. Age, and my mother still with her trauma of burying my father, burying her daughter, she was still able to get us um, to, through college, through our careers. Um, you talk about a strong, beautiful black woman, um, a village. And that's what inspires me to make sure that I fight for education. That's what inspires me to make sure that I fight for health care because no one should have to decide Oh, do I go to the doctors? Can I afford to go to the doctors? It's about health and that makes a difference to me. Jobs and opportunity. People always say, how do we help Baltimore City? Well, how do you help all of Maryland? Pe people to work, give them the opportunities. People are working three, two and three jobs. They're not home with their families. If they were making a decent wage, home with their families, it would make a huge difference. And so those are the things that I've been fighting for. Increase in minimum wage, that helps. And so I just will not give up. Jobs, justice and opportunity uh, has always been my vision. Um, being the Lieutenant Governor pick for Tom Perez as the Labor Secretary, that has been his career. Um, that's what he's been working for his entire career career as well. So okay. thank, you. thank mm -hmm. you. So with this, we're going to move into the next set of questions, which are, are a little bit more um, general questions and more information around um, the role of Lieutenant Governor and, and information uh, talking a little bit about the climate around voting. So let's start out and just for those who may not know, what exactly does the lieutenant governor do? Um, the governor, you, you always hear people talk about the governor. People need to know what the lieutenant governor is responsible for. Who'd like to take that question? I'll go. I'll jump right in. Because it's, see, you know, each, we have to say that each lieutenant governor um, it's up to the governor to decide, and we're partners in this. While we see that the president, uh, he, I mean, the um, lieutenant governor will um, preside over the Senate when they have to break a vote, uh, chair the task force, attend cabinet meetings, but it's truly up to, if you're a partner with the governor, that you guys work together and will be a partner um, to come up with a plan that you all want to do. So if you look in, at past governors and their lieutenant governors, it's all been different because it's up to it says in our constitution that it's truly up to the governor to decide what the lieutenant governor will be doing. So, so thank you. Um, Monique, I see you trying to jump in there as well. Was there something you want to add to that? She, she answered that beautifully. But, you know, I will say that uh, part of the conversation that I had with uh, Peter Francho, you know, I'm, I'm on uh, his ticket, um, was, look, I'm not going to leave a position of power to go to a position of ceremony. And the way that we understand the lieutenant governorship is that it is a position of ceremony, that there is no power intrinsically in that position unless the governor uh, gives that to you. So, you know, our, our months of conversations before, as we interviewed each other, um, 
really came down to I'm a doer and I intend you know, should I decide to to move forward with this to uh, to be your partner? And he said, "Thank you. That's what I want." I said, "I want a partner. I want a doer." <laughs> um, so, I think Shannon's answer was perfect. It is. Uh, it's really up to the person uh, in the governorship to determine how much of a partnership uh, they desire. And, and in our case, we talked through that for months before um, this final determination was made. And and uh, I think I'll just leave it at that. Okay. That's, I said that's why we are us three are here. <laughs> well, I was gonna say I can't see any of you being ceremonial, so let's be clear. Candace, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I think there's one piece that we have to absolutely remember is that in the unfortunate circumstance in the death of a governor or that they are otherwise incapacitated, the lieutenant governor has to be the person ready and willing to step in to do that job. Um, and it's really important that we have people in that role who are fully experienced at an executive level and able to lead at that in that way. Um, Doug will be the first person to say that this is the Gensler Hollingsworth administration, that we have a full partnership. Um, and I very much look forward to leading on issues of community economic development, housing, and being a real partner with Doug and being able to bring the blueprint for Maryland to full fruition. Excellent, excellent. So before we get to anyone being in office, we've got to get through to election days. And for those of us who have worked hard in the community to register voters, to turn out voters, to mobilize, um, we know that there's a constant battle against voter apathy, um, increasing voter turnout. So can we talk a little bit about how you're planning to fight some of this voter apathy? What are some of the things that um, that, that you're doing right now to get more folks out um, and get them educated and inspired? Can so, I start with you? Yeah, yeah. Sure. So when I stepped down from being mayor in December 2020, I stepped down so I could help grow an organization called Our Black Party. And Our Black Party is, an, is a political organization that was established to help support candidates and people um, and policies that advance a Black agenda, and especially at the local level, um, because we know that local politics are important. And that includes you know, educating voters about, about, about the policy process and electoral politics um, more broadly. And we have over 20,000 members to date in that organization. In Hinesville, we experienced um, year over year increase in voter turnout um, from 2015 to 2021, we continue to see that increase. And bef even before the pandemic, we passed, introduced and passed legislation to move to all vote by mail ballots. But I think we have to also remember that voter apathy doesn't come from oh, a person saying, oh, I just don't want to vote. I mean, there are folks that say that, but it, it originates from a place very deep. And I, I think I also want to make sure to give credit to legacy organizations like the NAACP who have done years and decades of work um, to get voters out. But vote apathetic voters come from politicians that don't keep their promises. And Black voters in particular um, continue to go in the voting booth and they rarely see the results of the selections that they make. Um, not only do they not see the results of those selections, they also experience a lot of gaslighting and the people saying, you know, I didn't really say that. I didn't mean that. Um, and so I think as, as those of us who are seeking elected office, it's important for us to make sure that we commit to doing what we said we were going to do. Absolutely. That we, that we make sure that we keep accountability in the midst of all of the, uh, the policy positions and the objectives and priorities that we have, that the one that undergirds everything is accountability, because that is the way that we, when we demonstrate that people can have faith in government and faith in their elected leaders, that is the way that we can begin to propel people to the voting booth because they recognize that it is something in it for them. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Candace. Shannon, let's go to you next. Anything you'd like to add to that? Absolutely. So I actually live in the zip code of 21217. Uh, many of our viewers may know that as um, Penn North, where the scene from um, during 2015, Freddie Gray, where the CVS is essentially burning, uh, folks are cutting the holes in that area. Um, you had probably about 9,000 residents. Um, and I would say in 2014, 15, I think it was surveyed oh, over 200 people voted um, out of 9,000 people living in this area. 
Um, and so what we have done in this area is uh, an organization was started um, of neighbors um, who actually engage residents um, to vote. Um, it's a black run organization. Um, they focus on what the neighbors want to focus on. And what they realize is when folks don't want, when folks don't vote, um, unfortunately, the politicians don't come out. And so they made it a point to up their numbers so they could uh, have politicians come to their community to advocate for their needs. Um, this organization is focused on um, having, making sure that they have civic engagement, that folks are educated about the process, that folks are going to city hall. Um, they are focused on food justice because there were more liquor stores in this community than there were um, grocery stores. And so this organization started like a pop-up food hub, uh, but now to add um, on the Avenue market, um, it's open all, all the time. So folks can essentially get fresh food and vegetables. Um, those are the things that make a difference. And if we just have people in the community that folks trust, um, hey, register um, to sign up, register, go vote, we'll pick you up, um, we'll drop you off, we'll educate you about the process. And that has made a difference in the 21217 zip code. And so that will make a difference all over. I feel like that's a pilot for what we need to do in those other, other areas that are not voting uh, throughout Maryland. Thank you, Shannon. Monique, anything you'd like to add to this conversation? Well, those all those points were fantastic. I think if, I, if I'm to add anything, it would be that um, I think one of the best things that happened to us in some respects was COVID. During that period of time, um, people started paying more attention to their immediate life situation because we were many of us were stuck at home. So we couldn't escape our, and go to our eight hour work day somewhere else. Uh, whatever our issues were at home became very, very highlighted. Uh, during that period of time as well, you know, we saw the, um, we saw our country go through, through changes as well, you know, with George Floyd and others. Um, and we really had, we were captivated because we weren't distracted by the normalcy of life. What that did, what I saw, was much less apathy as a result of that. Uh, for my part, uh, our engagement was extremely high because people, there was a short learning curve, people got on Zoom, people joined our meetings, people listened to discussions that impacted them. Uh, and and th that engagement is what really has carried on. And we have continued with that. It's going to be that engagement that keeps people focused, that keeps people aware of their own power. Because it's not us that you're voting for and that's empowered. It's really you being empowered by voting for us, <laughs> you know, for recognizing who's, who's fighting for you. But you've got to know because you've got to be engaged with those those people to know who is out there fighting for you. And I think most people got that um, got that wake up call uh, over the last uh, two years. Uh, and we did see, quite frankly, two years ago, um, the highest turnout voter turnout in Maryland. Uh, certainly in Prince George's County. Uh, so, you know, you, you kind of look at, uh, you look at the time and you see, look, this engagement has has really captivated people and we want to keep it going. Um, but but great answers and, and uh, I'm with you. We need to keep the engagement of NAACP and other organizations to uh, to make sure that we continue to be aware um, and that we are empowered to be a part of the process, recognize our power. All excellent points. Um, I, I also have noted that people, when they don't hear their issues being talked about on the campaign trail, they, it also goes to the feeling of what's the point? No one is speaking to what, what I have to deal with in my daily life. So having candidates on the ballot that speak to the day-to-day -day lives and concerns of, of all of the constituents within the district is so important. And to the point that was made earlier the, around accountability as well, um, people don't understand a lot of times that they can hold the people that they've elected accountable, not just by voting them out in between, but by raising their voices once they've gotten in office, letting them know you will be voted out if you don't do what you said you were gonna do. So thank you ladies for that. Uh, on a, in a similar vein, I also know, 
I've talked to a lot of people over the years. I have family and friends over the years who may only vote in presidential elections or um, in a gubernatorial election. They may not vote their whole ballot. They may just vote for the top one or two, um, one or two folks, or they may um, they may only vote in the in in the general election and and skip the primary altogether and just say that it's the general election that that counts. So. What what do you have to say to folks who are who are thinking along those lines? Vote for all of them. <laughs> and but again, here it goes back to the same. We have to make sure that folks know uh, that they are well aware of who even their before voting time is, who their elected officials are, what these positions are, and so it's about educating folks and making sure that they know about it. I mean, we used to have government classes. And so sometimes you got to go back and just reteach it. It's, it's, you have to be able to do that. I, I think about uh, working in U.S. Senator Chris Van Hollen's office um, when when people essentially lost their unemployment insurance to no fault of their own. They were going through the pandemic. Republicans and Democrats called our office. They called the federal government. And when you are stressed out and you don't find answers, you'll call everybody and anyone. You you don't care. And so you just want someone to like resolve the problem, to resolve the issue. And at the time when local government, when our senators and delegates uh, weren't able to solve those issues. When our governor weren't able to solve those issues, people called all over asking for help. And so that's why it, it, it's important that, that they know who their elected officials are on, on all levels, but it's important that we address the issues and concerns um, before there is a major problem. Like that's what we are there to do. That's what we wanna do. And that's what we should be doing. Thank you, Shannon. Candace or Monique, would you like to add anything to that? To the to the initial sure. question. Sure. I mean, you know, I'll add that uh, all levels of of uh, legislation should be working together. In other words, you shouldn't have just the executive. Uh, let me put it to you this way: um, I, I don't believe that there's any entity that's more important than any other entity. Um, in fact, I tell people that the most important vote that they're going to make will likely be the school board vote because that directly impacts them. That in impacts their home values because <laughs> your school impacts your home values. Um, it impacts the degree to which your children will be prepared and the community will be prepared. Um, and, and, and preferably you want well-prepared kids so that you have less crime. Um, but the truth is those in the higher, um, higher seated power uh, need to work well with local government. So it, it should never be a situation where the state level has no idea what's going on on the local level. As a uh, council member, I recognize the importance of being able to communicate with people on the state level because quite frankly, the money trickles down. And when we need resources, we need them to get the resources to then come down to us. We also need them to, uh, to, to fight for us so that um, our fight doesn't have to be as intense. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is a community, uh, it's a community of all of us to, to get this work done. Um, so saying all that to say, don't just vote during the presidential election because it is your local level that really gets, uh, you know, gets the work done and they hear you. you know, you're heard on the local level and from there, um, uh, the, progress, the progress continues. Thanks. Thank you. Candace, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, the simplest way I've said this in the past, I suppose, is that the, the further down on the ballot you get, the closer you get to you um, and the things that actually impact you on an everyday basis. Um, and so I would, one of the things, especially since we're talking about Democratic primary right now, where there are so many um, wonderful options I think that people have, I think it's great that there are so many people running. Um, Republicans are really good at voting R the entire ballot <laughs> from top to bottom. We don't do as good a job at that. We being Democrats don't do as good a job at that. And so it's important if we wanna make sure that people at least have the opportunity to lobby their issues with people who might be a welcoming ear, it's you know to try to pay attention at every level and in every election. Um, and it's also incumbent upon uh, elections, elections board and elections personnel to 
help do the work of educating voters. Um, for example, right now we're dealing with the change in the election dates from June 28th to July 19th. Yeah. And while that certainly makes it a bit more convenient for the candidates, you know, <laughs> candidates get a bit more time to file. It does damage to those who have been who thought they knew what the when the data vote was. And now, you know, there there isn't necessarily that much room to do that. And with the assaults on voting rights across the country and on getting people the actual information that they need, it's important to Mar for Maryland to always be a leader in that regard, making sure that our voters are educated, that we make sure that we maintain the accountability structure within uh, within local politics, no matter what party that we're in. Um, and that we make sure that we that we encourage folks who are that we encourage voters to be the best credible messenger to others about candidates who they're voting for. Uh, we don't go to restaurants just because a commercial told us to. We go to restaurants usually because someone that we know went to the restaurant. They had a great dinner. <laughs> And so it's important for each of us to go from here, from lead to lead from this forum and say, hey, I heard from so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so, and I think I think they they actually pay attention to the things that we care about, the things that I know that you care about, we should consider voting for them. This actually takes a full community to do. Um, and I think we should all make sure that we do our part. Thank you, Candace. And people, you know, people often complain. Well, first, let me say NAACP is a nonpartisan organization. <laughs> So I want to put that out there in case whoever's listening, we are not a democratic organization. We are a nonpartisan organization. We uh, welcome people from every party. Um, however, I just wanted to mention that people often, um, you know, when, when different cases come um, and, and people are concerned about the sentences that are being handed down in, in certain cases, you know, electing those local judges, the judges are often at the back of the ballot. Um, those local prosecutors, again, not at the top of the ballot. So if you don't go all the way through the ballot and make it a point to know who these people are, what is their record? Have you ever sat in um, sat in and, and listened to one of the sessions and really got a sense of, of who these folks are who are representing you? And, and like you said, the lower down on the ballot you are, um, the more close to home that things are gonna hit. So with that, we'll go into the next uh, section of our questions. Moving right along, uh, constitution, a constitutional amendment in the early 1900s um, made the Maryland governor that our model, it, we have one of the strongest governor models in the country, whereby the governor um, sets the budget and the state legislature is not allowed to uh, shift money from departments or add money to that budget. So where you, as where the governor uh, prioritizes and invests his money is, um, is very significant. So let's talk a little bit about um, if your administration was in office with the governor, with your, your running partner, what are some of the key areas that you have looked at as your funding priorities and programmatic priorities? And we can kick it off. Let's kick it off with um, Candace this time. I won the toss up, huh? <laughs> um, so, I, so Doug and I's vision for Maryland is, I think it's simpler for us to understand when we think about what he's spoken about as his experience as attorney general. He says, you know, you don't, he says, if you haven't sat with the mom who's lost her child, you know, kneeling on the sidewalk, you don't understand the gravity of dealing with violent crime. And on my side, I think about raising a teenage son and I empathize deeply with mothers who have lost their children to police violence. And both of those things have to coexist. Not those things, but changing the reality of both of those scenarios have to coexist. And so in our vision of being able to create a Maryland that is safe for everyone, that is also just, and that we have strong communities as the as the foundation of all of that. Our budget has to reflect the intertwining of all of the of those priorities. And building a safe community isn't just about, and actually, it isn't really about investing in law enforcement and criminal justice reform. It is about doing that and making sure that we invest in housing that we invest in building communities through affordable through affordable housing, that we make sure that schools are the same across the board, that people get quality education no matter where they are. I think about the experience that my kids have. They've been in Prince George's County Public Schools their entire educational careers, and their experiences have been very different depending on where they are. 
um, that we make sure that people are able to live in clean environments no matter where they live. All of those things are intertwined and part of being um, a, a safe community. And our task um, as a team is to make sure that that budget does not out-prioritize one over the other and that we make sure that we adequately and appropriately fund all of those areas that are necessary, the areas and agencies that are necessary for realizing that vision. And the one that most immediately, I think, comes to everyone's mind is the blueprint for Maryland. And so making sure that we do that in concert with all of the other areas as well. Thank you. Monique, let's go to you next. What are your key areas? For budget and priorities. Well, I, can, I can see. Steve. Sure, the budgeting priorities. Uh, we want to establish an office of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And for this reason, uh, there have been attempts and goals that have been missed. And we want to make sure that there are no excuses for not leveling this playing field. Um, so we're very intentional about implementing ways to do that through this office. Um, this office will obviously um, interface with um, our Board of Education for that equity. Uh, it will interface with Commerce for that equity and certainly opportunities for our, our MBEs. All of this goes into our safety because it, it goes to raising us all up. And our whole focus is um, raising all of us and not at the detriment of anybody else because we don't have to pull anybody down to raise the rest of us up. But we want to make sure that those who have typically not had the opportunity, those who've been marginalized, get the opportunities. So part of the other uh, portion of the investment will be to create 100,000 new jobs and looking to do that in 100 weeks. Those jobs will be family supporting jobs. And I want to say it that way because we've seen over the last year plus the great resignation because people are working in jobs that they're not really gaining anything from. We want family supporting jobs so that people have security in the work that they're doing. And we recognize that part of that is a greater investment in education and exposure experiences. Uh, exposure experiences being starting kids very young, um, allowing them to have a, an exposure on field trips, learning how to garden, watching a process, uh, playing with Legos, uh, participating in, um, in tournaments that are STEAM focused. And then as they move up, uh, exposing them to, to different environments. In other words, if I grew up uh, in Fort Washington and I've never been outside of Fort Washington, that's a problem. We want kids to be exposed to what they don't normally see so that they can see the possibilities. So that's an investment. And that is an investment in our future and that's an investment in safety for, for many reasons. Um, I think that uh, health, as I spoke about earlier, is a great determinant of that as well. Uh, so having healthy environments, uh, making sure we have green space in our communities because we know green space adds value. When you cut down trees, you cut down forest area, you're devaluing communities. And that's an intentional thing. Uh, working on our infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure is not always just what you see with our, our roads and bridges, but that's the stormwater management systems to decrease flooding in our communities, which of course takes value away from our homes. Um, and, and looking at our uh, infrastructure with our, our water utilities um, so that our water is safe. You know, it's really about the, the, complete, the complete safety of an individual, economic safety, housing security, food security, and environmental security, those things. And that's where our investment will go. Excellent, thank you. And Shannon. Thank you. So um, as a councilwoman, um, I made sure that uh, we were working with uh, families um, who needed, I would say, assistance and help. And so in that, you have to make sure that folks have jobs. I keep saying that that's so important. So making sure as a councilwoman, I made sure that when folks um, didn't just come in when there were new contracts and lost their jobs, um, I put in a bill to make sure that you at least give them time. Families need time to get their situations together if they're gonna be losing a job. It was 90 days that we implemented. Displaced workers, you give them 90 days for a 
person to prove themselves, to make sure that they are um, that they have somewhere to like stay um, because they've done a good job. They fire themselves when people aren't doing good work. The other thing was making sure that as a new mother, that you didn't have to choose between um, going to work or staying home because we didn't have safe places to lactate. So I put in a lactation bill. Um, I made sure that um, we had victims of police brutality uh, here in Baltimore City. So I put in a bill to make sure that victims of police brutality would be, um, that they would be heard and making sure that police officers were trained. We put money in those areas. That's huge all across Maryland. So making sure that when someone calls 911, that they know the difference between 911 and 311 when someone wants help, when someone needs help. Because uh, let's face it, uh, black men have been killed at the hands of police officers. And we want to make sure um, that they know the difference. So everyone is safe from our police officers to our residents in the community. Um, making sure that um, education, we will fully fund the education, the blueprint. Um, he said that over and over again. If we do not fully fund um, the, our education system, then our kids are going to be behind. So that's huge. MBEs, you hear a business is saying all the time that they are not able to get contracts. They just don't have the time that other big contractors have, they, that grant writers or folks to write the contracts, folks to go back and forth. Small businesses just don't have that time. And so not only what do we want to make the playing field even, we want to make sure that they can even get paid on time because small businesses, unfortunately, are not able to go uh, six months to a year without paying their employees. And so as the next lieutenant governor, these are things that we hear all the time that I want to make sure that we address. If you go into Baltimore City, uh, Baltimore County, if you go down to the Eastern Shore, one of our poorest counties in Maryland is Somerset. The, the infrastructure is falling apart. You can't find a decent store to even get fresh food. We have to address all those issues. So as the next councilwoman, as the next lieutenant governor, I want to make sure that those areas are where we're spending our money. Thank you. All right. So we're doing a, a time check here. We're going to give a, a minute each for the remaining questions. Um, our next question is, so 70 percent of those incarcerated in Maryland are are black. Maryland incarcerates more black men than any state in the country, falling second only behind Mississippi and black youth in the juvenile detention system made up nearly 80 percent of all incarcerated in Maryland in 2019. And as we all know, once a person has a criminal record, it's difficult to obtain housing, uh, achieve additional education and employment and recidivism rates are nearly 50 percent nationally. So we know that racial bias and the need for reform greatly impacts these numbers. So how will your administration address these issues, break the cycle and or disrupt the infamous school to prison pipeline that exists in many low income communities of color? Monique, would you like to kick it off? Sure. Uh, well, I always think education is an elixir. Um, education, 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 exposure, exposure, exposure. So it's, it's one, you do what you see. And uh, there's a reason there's a cycle in, in some communities because that is maybe what they see in their immediate. But that's not what the world is about. And so we wanna get people out of that um, and, and learn about what other opportunities there are for them. But more than that, we want to bring the opportunities to them. And the way that's done is uh, through school exposure and out of school exposure. Uh, one of the discussions that we've had, and, and this is, by no means stating that we would change our, our school week. But what we did learn during uh, COVID is that there were many teachers who felt that, uh, that everybody got a mental break, in, including the students, when they had their kind of flex day on Wednesdays. So they had a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday schedule with Zoom, and then Wednesday was more of a flex day. But looking at that as um, maybe building in some opportunities for exposure, internships, um, uh, volunteer opportunities, uh, field trips, those types of things, um, small, small group um, to talk about feelings and uh, what one is going through mentally, because the truth is there's a lot of pressures on, on kids, on Absolutely. students, on, um, on young people and older people for that matter. Um, so just sort of how to deal with what we're all going through. Um, and, and sometimes it's as simple as just getting some time to do some self-care, uh, but looking at how we can include that as 
a part of the educational experience. Um, so it's not just limited to <laughs> when there is an issue. We want to yes. diffuse things before they become an issue. And, and you know, as a mother, um, certainly I've dealt with all sorts of things. So 23, 22 and 16 year old. Um, I've been in the corner sometimes like, ooh, how do I handle this? <laughs> but I think that um, discussions are important and, and allowing them to express themselves. Um, many times crimes are committed not because people are bad people, but uh, Sometimes it's, it's as simple as survival. So we've got to look at what can we do to make it easier for families so that uh, uh, the, the default is let me ask someone for help as opposed to let me go take something or let me go hurt somebody in order to uh, feed myself. Or, you know. Okay. All right. I'm going to have to, I'm gonna have to stop you there. Let, um, let's, that's I, yeah. thank, thank you. Candace, let's go to you next. Any, any other, anything else you'd like to add to this? Sure. Um, so cr crime and the long term effects of crime disproportionately affect communities of color. Um, and that includes the incarceration rate. And I think the first thing that we have to do and that I know that uh, Doug and I are committed to doing is trying to plug the hole when it comes to um, the overwhelming number of people who are incarcerated in the state of Maryland. And one of those ways is to pri stop prioritizing nonviolent offenses and drug offenses. Um, and instead moving moving towards efforts like community prosecution, drug courts, and domestic violence dockets, which Doug was able to do when he was a state's attorney and attorney general uh, for Maryland. Um, the other thing that I think we have to, and, and Monique certainly alluded to this, which is the need for recreational opportunities for young people, because young people don't stand outside on the corner or skip school or act out in class because they want to, they do it because there's something going on. Sometimes it's because they got to figure out a way to make ends meet because their mom don't have enough money to pay the bills. Sometimes it's because, oh, I'm in the ninth grade and I can read on the fourth grade level and all of this thing just makes me feel embarrassed and so I'm going to act out. Whatever those things are, we have to make sure that we get to the root causes of those and make sure that we address that as well. Um, and lastly, when we come to, when we talk about reentry population, we have to we have to start to take on an attitude of expecting return, that we make sure that people who are incarcerated have resources and opportunities while they are, in, while they are incarcerated to be able to make sure that they have adequate health care, that they have adequate mental health services, and that they also have opportunity to access workforce and training, training services so that when they leave facilities, they are able to get jobs and are able to move on and to um, be able to be contributing members of society in this new role. And I think it's also important for us as, st as a state to make sure that we remove those barriers, especially with regard to discriminatory practices in housing and hiring, so that returning citizens are actually able to get back on their feet and do what, do what it is that everyone at the end of the day wants to make sure they do, and that's to live, thrive, and provide for their families. Absolutely. Thank you, Candace. Shannon, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, so in each jurisdiction, we actually have um, hubs where folks are able to find jobs. We're unique in Baltimore City where we actually have the REC. It's a reentry center for folks who are coming back home. And so they get all the wraparound services. And so I feel like those hubs need to be placed in all those different places for folks coming home so they, one, can get the job, so they can get housed. And if you don't have anywhere to lay your head, it is really hard for you to think about a job. If you don't have food in your stomach, it is really hard for you to think about a job and you're on edge. What are you going to do? And so I feel like all the bills in the past that have wrongly, um, where men and women have been arrested, we've already mentioned that low charges like marijuana, drug offenses, all of those things need to be addressed. We want to make sure that those kind of things are off the books so they won't end up in jail because what happens is a repeat cycle and then they come back home and have to get jobs. So how do you stop that? You make sure we take certain things off the books. As a councilwoman, I make sure that let's look at marijuana. Folks need jobs, but we're still hindering folks because we would, we keep saying if you smoke weed, then you won't be able to get a job. Well, that's nonsense. Who's testing for that? If you look at other places, no one's testing for that for Baltimore City. Remove it from the books. I always as was said as a councilwoman, I want to remove barriers. And so if there are any barriers that's going to stop people from living a good, successful life, let's remove it. It becomes a hindrance. So that's how I look at it. All right, thank you. So next question. 
So more than 90,000, it's a staggering number, 90,000 Black women and girls have gone missing since 2020. We've also heard of Native American and Latinx, Hispanic communities also having extremely high numbers of missing women. However, we don't get the media coverage that is deserved and oftentimes not the same law enforcement resources towards um, towards solving these cases and resolving these 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 um, these cold cases. So some of the disappearances could be lift. Uh, they, they could be linked to just, just flat out abductions from strangers, um, human trafficking situations, domestic violence. Um, but there are many other situations that could cause um, these women and girls to go missing. So what would your administration do to combat this issue and raise awareness? I'll, I'll jump in as a councilwoman, uh, Councilman Chris Barnett had actually had a sex, tra a sex trafficking bill in um, that I supported as a councilwoman to make sure that there were in hotels that we had hotlines for folks to call, that there were numbers around the city. Uh, I really believe that putting in the task force, because we've all have seen it, where we're like, why aren't they getting this immediate attention? Um, and so I think it's having a partnership as a media person, making sure that certain stories are covered. As a mother of a young girl, or when I see it, my heart kind of like stops. I'm like, have I seen that person? Like I'm sharing the photos on Facebook because I want to make sure that if this person is missing, that we like go after the person, like we want to help them. So I think it's first expanding what we have. Again, a pilot that we have in Baltimore City, that we take it all across the state of Maryland. Um, I, there's no point of reinventing a will. It's going off with some of these programs that are good that we have all over the country. So that's where I would start. I would actually look at what we have and expand in it. Thank you. Candace. Sure. So there's what we, what we feel we know. And then there's what we actually know. And I know as black women, we feel that there's a lot more attention that's given to people, especially white women and girls when they go missing than, than happens with our own. And I think it would be important for us to make sure that we collect the data that's necessary so that we can hold, hold agencies accountable to clearing these instances of missing um, and endangered women and girls in the state of black women and girls um, in the state of Maryland. I'm a member of, um, well, I'm a Sisters on the Planet ambassador for Oxfam America. And one of our priorities over the last three years has been addressing gender-based violence, particularly uh, in the Northern Triangle area. And especially in Maryland, where we have a, lar a large number of immigrant families that come to uh, this state, that uh, relocate to this state, they have experienced certain traumas um, and have experienced certain issues back home that we now have to address as a state. Um, in addition to that, we also have to make sure we pay attention to the services and supports that are that are made available for trans women, especially for sex workers, um, because all of those experiences create conditions where people may feel and actually are unsafe. Um, and so the other part of our approach to this, in addition to making sure that we have the data that we need to be able to, to address the issue effectively, is also to make sure that we provide the financial support to nonprofit organizations that are part of this village and this network of support and protection for women and girls across the state of Maryland. Thank you, Monique. Yeah, you know, listen, you know, this is unacceptable, <laughs> but we've been accepting it. Um, you know, the truth is we have um, one of our star basketball players in Russia right now being detained and nobody's saying much about that. Uh, Brittany Gaynor has been over there. Um, this is something that I followed as a council member and uh, actually did a little bit of studying and, um, and, and worked closely with our state's attorney to try to figure out, you know, what is it? Why is it that we have missing people and there's no real follow-up? Uh, one of the challenges that, we, that we've heard is that, you know, there are runaways and runaways go away and then they come back home. We don't have any means of following those people who've actually come back. And I guess the greater question is, why do they run away in the first place? You know, are we dealing with some, some issues um, that, that are greater issues? Uh, when people do disappear, are we even aware of it? Uh, one of the concerns that, um, that we have is no one has really invested enough time in this. So we want to build oversight and look into um, how we can do a better job of, 
of, of focusing on these people that, that go missing. I want to add to that, um, during the pandemic period, many students obviously were away, many uh, went to school on Zoom, but when school did come back, there were a lot of children that did not return. And a big question has been, where are those children? Did they move away? Are they missing? Because we don't know, because there is no real follow-up. It used to be that when the schools were open, you know, you could kind of, uh, you had counselors who would walk the halls and, and kind of monitor uh, people in different situations. You don't know what kind of abuses are going on when, um, when those students aren't, um, when you can't put your hands on them, so to speak, when they're not uh, with you every day. Uh, so this is something that, that as a lieutenant governor, certainly uh, under the Francho Anderson Walker administration, and we want to make sure that uh, we pay close attention to and that we figure out what best practices we can put in place to uh, assure that we keep all of our people safe. Lastly, I do want to say in the immigrant community, uh, many times there's fear. When, uh, when there's a crime committed, when, when, when someone goes missing, to say anything because of, because of one's status. Um, and, and so we want to you know, allay those fears so that uh, we can really make sure people are in healthy situations and uh, we can stay on top of, of our community. Oops, thank you so much, Monique. We, I did hear uh, in doing a little bit of research around this was that lobbyists and advocates had talked about how too often um, the, the black women and girls would be categorized as runaways for longer periods than others, um, even in the most suspicious of, of situations. Um, Our Black Girls is a website that I've been um, checking out of these last few weeks that has some amazing stories run by African-American women um, bringing light to this situation. Thank you all for, for your response to that. Um, next, touching a little bit, we, we've talked a little bit around um, alleviating poverty here in Maryland. We're, we're one of the most prosperous, prosperous states in the nation, um, but yet the number of residents who receive uh, SNAP, formerly known as food stamps, it's up higher now than it was um, during the recession, up to almost 900,000 uh, residents receiving uh, SNAP to just to get by. Almost 50% of our students um, qualifying for free and reduced price meals. So we know that means a lot of people are making tough decisions every day, just trying to put food on the table. I think you've each touched a bit on um, important economic investments that would help to curb this. But could you talk a little bit more about uh, what you would do to curb poverty and bring folks um, up to, uh, I love that term, the family supported wage or living wage. Thank you. Let's start with you, Shannon. So as a council member, I was in Annapolis supporting, testified to make sure that we increased uh, minimum wage, uh, worked with the unions, worked with um, everyday citizens across Maryland to make sure that we voted on this bill. Um, and so it was unfortunate that here in Baltimore City, our mayor at the time vetoed that bill because uh, she said businesses couldn't afford it. And I'm saying, business can't afford to pay people, um, that doesn't make sense. Um, we need businesses. We're not trying to bank up any business. Um, but what we want to make sure is that when you take care of your people who are working, the people can take care of their families and they're in return will take care of you. Um, and so as a council, as a uh, lieutenant governor candidate, that's still what I hold true. We have to make sure that people are making decent wages. We have to make sure that people across Maryland um, support bills like that. And I will make sure that I'll work with our colleagues uh, in, this, in Annapolis um, to make sure that they support this. I, I, I just don't get it. This is how I see this going. Thank you. Monique. Well, um, you know, we have many pledges um, that address pretty much every issue that we brought up in this conversation. Um, and the whole purpose is because we recognize that the family is critical and that we need to protect the family. Um, and, and that is, no one should be working two and three jobs to make ends meet. Uh, part of what we're wanting to do is create pathways to the middle class 
with family supporting jobs. And I, I outlined earlier in our, one of the answers how we want to have 100,000 new jobs in 100 weeks. Um, we're very excited about this because it's actually a plan that's implementable. Uh, we, we hear a lot of talk and rhetoric, but but we've actually been very result oriented, and um, and our focus and our pledges is to to be intentional about addressing issues. We're tired of talking. I know I am. I'm 51 years old. I ran for office the first time four years ago. So I'm not a career politician. I'm a businesswoman. But more importantly, I'm a caring mother, and not just to my kids, to other kids and to families. When you see suffering, you recognize no one in this affluent community should be suffering. But we've got to talk about some of the, the truths. You can make a lot of money in the state of Maryland, but you're going to spend a lot of money to live in the state of Maryland for housing, for food, in some cases for education, for health care. So we talk a lot about income, high incomes, but that's just what you spend. You know, wealth is what we want because that's what you're able to pass down. And that's what we have built into our pledges, actual generational wealth building. And to do that through our home ownership, through job creation. And when I say job creation, I mean family supporting job creation <laughs> opportunities and uh, an investment in healthcare proximity. So that when you step out of your house, if you're having a, a bad day and you need to get to uh, a doctor, you need to be seen. We want to have a federally qualified health center, FQHC if you're underinsured or not insured, within 15 minutes of you. We want to have other health care options within 15 minutes of your house because we recognize it is your access to health care that's going to determine whether you actually follow up and get yourself taken care of. This is, this is all part of the balance of, of wealth. And this, this feeds into your question of SNAP. Uh, we see the majority of people who go bankrupt or go through, health, uh, go through uh, financial problems much of that is based on health issues that are draining the pockets. So we do see this as um, part of the, the big picture uh, in order to assure that wealth can be attained. And that is, that's a part of our very intentional planning, uh, which you'll find in, on the website. in our documents. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Candice. Um, I remember when I was in elementary school, my mom, every Every year, she'd say, you're going to fill out that application for a free lunch. Um, even though my mom worked a government job, she was she worked for the Department of Human Services um, as a social worker. Um, the reason being because even though, and we got denied every year. We got denied because my mom made too much money to for me to get free lunch. But she applied because she needed it. And there, even though we have the data and the statistics for people who, for the people who are on free and reduced meals and people who do receive SNAP benefits, there are a number of people, probably the same amount of people who are just barely getting by with the take home pay that they have. And so we have to recognize that, you know, as cost of living in, is increasing, expenses are increasing generally, that wages are not keeping pace. On top of that, we have families that are led by folks that sometimes don't have access to good jobs themselves. And so it's important for us when we talk about building community, a lot of times people can feel like that that's something, you know, feel good stuff. Building community isn't feel good stuff. That's actually the bones in, of everything that, we're, that we want to do. In building a great state, it starts with great communities. And when we're building great communities, that means you are creating spaces where employers want to go where people want to live. And so when we attract high quality job, that we, jobs that we focus on training and retraining individuals so that they can get jobs that are in the local labor market. So they don't have to worry about working in a field that's no longer applicable or getting training in something that they can't even find a job in. That we make sure that we have a full cycle of employment services that's connected to all of our workforce development agencies across this state. Um, and I think that when we do that, we will we will start to make sure that we advance economic opportunity for everyone by starting at the point where we, where we at least know that folks are able to live, get a job and provide for their families. Beyond that, um, especially when it comes to farm students, I've seen the lunches that my kids get offered at school sometimes why they take their lunch every day. For many kids in Maryland, the lunch that they receive at school is the only meal that they get on a day. And so it's important that we also use the weight of the state to make sure that the, that the meals that they are provided are healthy, 
and that they are actually um, nutritional in value and that they provide some something for their families, um, something for them to sustain themselves while they're in school. Can I can I just say something real quick? It's so funny that you um, say something about food. My five-year-old, we were sending her to school with lunch, um, but she would come back and the lunch wouldn't be, it, it would still be there. And so someone said, that means she's eating the school lunch. Let's see how long it lasts. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay. Well, we're going right from lunch, from lunch and um, school meals into health and health concerns. How can we and how will your administration work to address health dis disparities and bias um, in the health system and make it more accessible and affordable? So this includes not just traditional health care, but also dental, which is sky high and mental health, which you know, has not been traditionally considered as part of healthcare, but we've all seen in these last two years in particular that that dealing with our mental trauma is just as important as dealing with our physical trauma. We've touched on this a bit throughout our conversation. If any of you have something to add, um, I will give you that opportunity as well. Um, Shannon, would you like to add on anything else around addressing health bias and disparities? I think I said it earlier, my mom went through it firsthand. I, and so it, it really affects the family. And so it's a shame that here uh, in the United States of America that people still have to choose between uh, going to the doctors because they're scared of a, a bill um, suffering because they can't go to the dentist. It's, it's it, it falls under, I, I think I addressed it. That's one of the things that Tom and I, it's a top priority for us because of it's happened in my family. Thank you, Monique. Anything you'd like to add on to this subject? Well, certainly. Uh, Peter Franchot and I uh, are, are really dedicated to health. I mean, we've, we've talked about several issues regarding um, uh, establishing uh, more frequency, greater frequency of federally qualified health centers, of uh, outpatient facilities. As a commercial realtor, and I've been one for 22 years, um, I negotiated to bring the, uh, the CBOC, which is the outpatient uh, VA hospital. Uh, outpatient facility uh, to Maryland, uh, to to, Fort, to the uh, Prince George's County area. Um, but look, all of these are part of my understanding and my dedication to health. I've also, as a, uh, you know, in my capacity, brought in a mental health uh, inpatient facility uh, to the area as well. I recognize the importance of health. My, my father's a a uh, former military uh, guy and a physician, so you know, health has been a big focus. But I do want to say the expansion of Medicaid and Medicare are something that uh, Peter Francho and I have um, put into our plan. It's critical. Uh, we talked earlier about the bankruptcies, the challenges that people go through financially because of the lack of insurance and their unawareness that they qualify for these expanded services. So we want to uh, get more education out there for people to recognize that they do have access to, to Medicare when they do, um, and Medicaid services uh, as well. And, and certainly working with our um, community hospitals or small community hospitals and establishing um, a greater opportunity for prescription assistance uh, support. Uh, as a council member, I established a prescription assistance program because we recognized during COVID people were dying because they weren't taking care of managing their underlying health conditions. So we put something in place um, for people to get coverage, whether they're underinsured, not insured at all, or simply needed co-payment assistance because people were making the decisions. Hey, I think I'd rather pay this other bill than worry about my health, but we want you to worry about your health. So we're gonna make it so that health is prioritized and we're gonna make it easy for people to do so. Thank you. Candace, anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, I didn't, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I didn't start seeing a dentist regularly until I was 23 years old. And that was because I had a full-time job and I had benefits. Um, even my mom working for the state, we had health insurance with, that didn't include dental. Um, but if we think about, that's where things like community health centers would have been a great asset to me growing up because it allows us to have the preventive care that prevents those big bills down the road. Um, and in Prince George's County, there are a number of community health centers that have been real fixtures, especially for um, for black and immigrant families in our communities because they provide those necessary services and not just 
emergency or urgent or emergent emergent care services, but also things like diabetes screening or hypertension screening, HIV. Prince George's County has one of the highest rates of HIV um, in, infection in the state. And so it's important, Northern Prince George's at least. And so investing in community health centers to make sure that those are accessible in every community across the state will be a priority for us. And second to that, it'll also be for mental health. Before my dear friend, Kevin, um, passed away in at the end of January, I probably would not have put mental health as one of the top five things on my list of priorities. But having experienced that, um, it has been something that I am really proud to be a partner with Doug, to be a partner with someone who has proactively thought about the importance of mental health at every phase of our lives, including those who are incarcerated, to make sure that we have that access across the board, young to old. Um, and one of the goals there is to make sure we have 10, is to create 10 new behavioral um, health centers across the state um, in every region of the state so that everyone has access to the important services that they need. Thank you, Candace. I'm very sorry for your loss as well. So with that, that brings us to the end of my questions. I would love for each of you to just share a closing statement with our viewers and for the many viewers who'll be watching this in the future as well. Um, is there anything else you would like us to know? What's on your heart tonight? Um, anything that you did not get to lift up in the conversation that you'd like to lift up now? And you have up to two minutes. I'm sorry. Monique, we'll begin with you. Did it come through, Monique? Sure. You know, I just thank you so much. I appreciate you so much for giving me the opportunity, uh, giving us all this opportunity to, to discuss uh, these very important issues. Um, I wanna say my whole focus is being transformative. Uh, Peter and I are looking to make transformational change. We're not interested in keeping things the way that they are. Um, everything that we put out in terms of our platforms and our leveling the playing field, which by the way, we were the only, um, <laughs> Uh, only candidates to come out with a leveling the playing field, dealing specifically with, uh, with, with black issues. Um, and and we, we're, really, we're really focused on, on wealth building and the intentionality of doing that and knowing how to get that done. I, I didn't mention earlier, but I wanna throw in here that financial literacy is a huge part of that. And we're very excited that uh, Delegate Jay Walker, who I know very well, um, was able to lead sponsor a financial literacy bill to make this part of the curriculum in all Maryland schools. And that bill uh, will be heard in the Senate tomorrow. It, uh, it passed um, in the House uh, unanimously. Uh, and we're excited about that. But listen, this is critical. The fact that this bill has been in since 2010 and it's just now coming out and God, God help us that it comes out tomorrow. Um, this is critical because this makes a difference uh, in the lives of our children, whether they sink or swim. And we want them to swim. We want them to succeed. So thank you again. I, I look forward to um, continuing to serve the state of Maryland. And uh, I'm just honored to have been invited here today. Thank you so much for this opportunity. We look forward to the continued partnership with the NAACP. Thank you. Thank you. Shannon, we'll go to you next. I just want to also say thank you. Thank you for sharing this platform with us. Thank you to my sisters who are here. It's been great to hear their stories and to get to know them. I'm looking forward to meeting them actually in person as well. Um, I just want to say that we are, uh, uh, Tom and I, um, through our experience, um, through our um our past is um, what we are out here fighting for. We understand, I, I know I personally understand being raised by a single mother, um, just having all the obstacles in front of us, not giving in to those obstacles, um, to overcoming those obstacles. And that's what I've been doing as a councilwoman. Um, I really fought to make sure that the, the, the barriers were removed, um, that we fought for Maryland working families, um, that we made sure that uh, we're fighting for education, um, making sure that jobs, justice, and opportunity uh, is what Tom and I are fighting for. We've been doing the work and we will continue to do the work um, for Maryland working families. Excellent. Thank you, Shannon. And Candace, how about you close this out? 
I want to thank you, um, Brooke, for the opportunity for putting this together um, and also give thanks posthumously to the Senator Verda, Verda Welcome because it is on her shoulders that we all stand and I am just incredibly proud to be a part of that legacy, however small. Um, and thank you for being allowing me the opportunity to be in conversation with my sisters in service and my soror. Um, <laughs> and so it's just, a, it's been a wonderful evening. I think um, what I would like to leave folks with is just that uh, people ask, what am I most proud of when it comes to my service in the city of high school? What are you, what, you know, what's your greatest accomplishment? And I, it's not a program or a service that I point to, although there have been many. What I point to is something that is not quite sexy. It is that we raise the expectations of what government can do. Our residents had the city government, if you had to put them on number three or a top three or top five places or people that they would call if they had an issue before 2015, that was not the case. After 2015 and during my term, not only did people see the government, the local government as a powerful tool to help, they also felt that we were supposed to help and that we should help and that we were that we were competent enough to do it. And I think that is the most powerful thing is that when you as elected leaders are giving people the trust in your ability and your competence to get hard things done, and that we did that in Hinesville, that is an absolute treasure to me. Um, and for this work that we're all embarking on doing to be Lieutenant Governor for the state of Maryland, it is not lost on me that this is a historic moment and the opportunity to elect a black woman to statewide office in the state of Maryland. But it's my goal to make sure that we make that history meaningful. That means that black Marylanders can see the results of having a black woman in office. And that it's important that we are able to see, um, it's important to me that when we take this office, that they have two very competent and experienced leaders. So if God forbid something were to happen to Doug Gansler, that there is a very competent professional who's, who's there and ready to step in and someone who's willing to lead with him from the very beginning. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thank you to the entire, my entire panel, my sisters, powerhouses. Congratulations to each of you for stepping out there uh, on faith and for stepping out there for what you believe in, what you're so passionate about uh, to represent the community and for taking time again out of your schedule to be with us tonight. Thank you to all those who um, were watching with us, who took some time to uh, make notes in the chat. We appreciate you tonight. On behalf of the NAACP, we want you to remember to re register. To I'm sorry, the deadline to register to vote for the primary election is June 28th. We want everyone to vote in the primary election, which is now going to be held on July the 19th. And let's get ready for change. Let's, let's get ready for change. Let's get involved and let's make it happen. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. And feel free to go to franshow.com for more information. <laughs>